still a lot trend following, as we all know, is a very painful strategy because most of the time you can be underwater and you can uh, have periods of one, two, three years that you are underwater, which makes managing and also from an investor type of view makes it very difficult. Or, and then you start questioning your approach. You are maybe forced by investors to change things. Although on the long term view, nothing has changed. Or, and this is, I think, the big challenge everyone in our, our industry has. But on the other hand, we also see a lot of resilience or in our industry because most of the competition and on the of the successful trend following CTS they are around for 15, 20, 30, 40 years. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where today Alan Don and I are joined by Bruno Gmür, founder and CIO of Quantica Capital, as part of our mini series focusing on the one investment strategy that beat everything else in 2022, namely trend following and manage futures more broadly. First off, Bruno, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have been looking forward to this a lot, as and as you know, I've been looking forward to this for quite a few years, um, and I hope you're doing well. Thank you very much, Niels. No, nope, we are doing well. So, uh, as you know, we are sitting in Zurich, just around 5,100 meters from the epicenter of uh, Swiss banking. And uh, as you can imagine, it was uh, all but a boring week in recent times. But uh, thank you. Uh, we are indeed, indeed. I'm sure we'll probably touch on that uh, a little bit. But anyways, before we dive into uh, to all the topics that we're going to discuss, um, I would very much like if you could just set the stage a little bit for the audience and give, you know, a few minutes of background to Quantica and perhaps sort of share a few highlights and also what type of strategy um, sort of from a, a 30,000 feet point of view um, that you run today and where the business stands as we have started 2023. Sure, Niels. Thank you. So Quantica Capital is a Swiss systematic investment management boutique based in Zurich. And with a rather small and focused team of 14 people, 10 in the investment team, we are managing at the moment 800 million in our flagship product, which is the Quantica Managed Futures program that has now just completed its uh, 18 years track record. And uh, our QMF program, how we call it, is the only thing we do. So we are not diversified in terms of different products, different approaches and the QMF program can be considered and is considered as a style consistent medium term trend following program that is fully focused in liquid markets. So we trade only futures markets, no OTC products, no options on the liquid space. Just maybe we can discuss this later to have a most effective and efficient implementation with the least cost and implementation costs possible. So as said, the program uh, has successfully completed an 18 year track record. Our client base is uh, highly diversified with regards to regional and uh, type of investors. We have different vehicles, although we only manage one program. It comes in usage format. It comes in the Cayman format. And uh, obviously, we also can um, uh, do uh, managed accounts that allow for more, let's say, specific restrictions in the in the implementation of our program. But uh, yeah, that's basically a short introduction. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's perfect, uh, Bruno. Very much appreciate that. Um, now, uh, as you may know, Bruno, um, Alan and I have a list of 
different topics that we like to discuss with our friends uh, and we kind of go um, sort of alternate a little bit in terms of uh, who leads out uh, one specific topic. So as we always do, I'm going to let Alan kick it all off today. So over to you, Alan. Thanks, Niels. Uh, good morning, Bruno. Um, maybe just to get started, uh, you, you, I mean, you mentioned, uh, I, I suppose, some of the features of the of the Quantica Managed Futures, medium term trend following, and and very much a focus on on liquid markets. Could you give us a sense on, you know, what was the journey to to, to bringing you that from a kind of a an investment philosophy perspective? Uh, was that based on your, you know, experience in markets that you you kind of settled on trend as as the core of the program, or based on academic research, or or, or, or you know, how did your, um, I, I suppose, philosophy evolve to to have a, a focus on trend following? Yeah, thank you, Alan. So. I think that's a good point to start. So to understand our philosophy and our investment approach and our differentiating factors, it's probably helpful to look back at where we are coming from and what Quantica's history and background was. So first and importantly, no one at Quantica has ever worked or has ever uh, had any touching points with other CTAs or trend followers. So all what we did was developed completely independent of any, let's say, uh, let's say similar um, peers or, or peer group experience. So in fact, from my background, it's actually coming from the complete end or opposite spectrum of, uh, of trading. So my background was more in academics. So I spent more than uh, 10 years in the ivory towers of, uh, of universities. First, uh, studying mathematics and uh, doing my master's uh, with uh, uh, with focus on probability theory, mathematical finance, and statistics, and then was attracted more by application of those models. So I did my PhD at the University of Zurich, also doing research and uh, having uh, doing lectures for uh, graduate courses for more than ten years in the subjects of financial markets, game theory, econometrics, and all kind of other quantitatively related stuff. So basically from that, I was grown up and raised under the dogma, of course, of mathematical models and uh, of uh, efficient market uh, hypothesis, right? So on my first job then that I had in the financial industry, I was doing, I was hired in the chief investment office of a large Swiss private bank. And my job was to develop quantitative models to improve the tactical and strategic asset allocation, right? So that was the first job and being, of course, coming from the more theoretical model type of uh, things. A tactical overlay was already questionable from a, from an efficient market hypothesis view, but uh, we did the tasks uh, to optimize tactical allocations coming from a strategic long-term, let's say, allocation. And what you are doing when you are tactical allocations basically is you are looking at typically at quarterly investment horizons, right? The tactical overlay works usually or is implemented at banks or at uh, larger uh, investment firms on a quarterly basis. And when you implement a tactical overlay, be it an asset allocation overlay or a risk allocation overlay, what you are effectively doing is you are creating a spread, right? So think about the tactical allocation of a 60-40 portfolio. If you change that, you are basically overweight equities, underweight bonds, or vice versa. So what we did at that time was just looking at those spreads on a risk-adjusted basis between different asset classes and different instruments. And what I found there independently was that indeed those risk-adjusted spreads between different markets or market segments at what I then called a trend following market inefficiency. So indeed, they had kind of a path dependency. So our thesis then was that actually, yes, markets that 
outperformed other markets with kind of a typical quarterly investment horizon did continue to outperform, which was basically a contradiction to the market efficiency hypothesis. And that was the starting point, right? After detecting that, I kind of converted from uh, being a, a believer of uh, market efficiency theory in practice to trying really to implement the, those kind of call it inefficiencies into, into models. And this is still what is at the basis of our investment process or investment philosophy is to detect trend following inefficiencies on a quarterly or medium term basis, but on a more risk based and on a more relative basis, right? So we detect relative risk adjusted trends. And this makes us in most of the times highly correlated to the CTA industry. But in other times, our returns can differ quite a bit because they are based on kind of a, a relative approach or in modern, um, in modern terminology, you could also say uh, uh, cross-sectional momentum. So it's not only time series momentum, it also has an element of cross-sectional momentum. But this is still the philosophy that we, that we have. And actually, when we started the Quantica Managed Futures program, I mean, think back 20 years ago, uh, CTAs and trend-following strategies were considered more a black box, right? So nobody really understood what we were doing. And it was never our objective to do just another trend follower or CTA. In fact, at that time, I was not even aware on, um, on time series momentum or other things. The only thing that I detected was our approach that was designed to build a tactical overlay on a, let's say, a strategic risk allocation was uncorrelated basically to everything except for something that was called managed futures or CTAs, right? So this, I think, is important to understand where we are coming from and what our differentiating points are still. And you mentioned uh, that differentiation or the, the, one possible differentiation being the focus on um, relative trends, which is not something necessarily shared by all CTAs. And uh, so maybe it got useful to explain that a little bit um, uh, more detail. And also, you know, some people might question, is, is it the same philosophy why you would get directional trends as, as to why you would get relative trends? Yes, that's a good question. And uh, we can highlight that, let's say, in two different uh, ways. So the easiest way, if you just think what, let's call it the traditional CTA or a time series momentum when to model does, is it just looking at usually daily returns of the different markets. And it's just analyzing, let's say, trend signals, moving averages, breakout models, or whatever kind of trend signals on each of those markets individually, right? So our approach on relative trend following is just expanding that universe of potential, let's say, markets to consider. So think about that maybe in terms of if you are trading or analyzing 100 different futures markets, at the first stage in our, let's say, signal generation process, we normalize those daily returns by its risk. We do it with volatility. We can discuss that uh, maybe later. So out of those 100 markets that trade on very different volatility regimes um, or specific, let's say, volatility environment, we smooth out or extract that market-specific volatility and normalize those 100 markets to what we could call 100 risk factors that all trade on the same, on the same, uh, let's say, risk in the same risk regime. Now, when you have this, you can enlarge now those 100 markets by looking at each spread. So basically, you can generate out of those, well, those 100 markets, you can generate 10,000 spreads. And this is basically our data universe on that we want to, to detect the trends. So basically you could say 
all right, instead of just looking trend filters on those 100 markets, we look at trend filters in terms of outperformance on these 10,000 markets, already giving us a much more uh, robust approach or much more stability. The other way you could look at that and what actually the, the difference is on that approach is that already on the signal generation stage in the process, the state of the covariance matrix or the state of the covariance um, structure of the market comes already in in the signal generation uh, stage. And this is the biggest difference to uh, compared to a, to a time series momentum approach when the covariance structure maybe at the end comes in the portfolio construction process, but not in the signal the generation process. So the outcome of that, to simplify maybe a little bit, is that whenever the correlation matrix or the correlation covariance structure in the markets is more stable, our trend signals move slower. If that covariance structure changes rapidly, our relative, let's say, trend indicator can move faster. And this is uh, how we usually relate our differences to traditional trend following performance that in times when the covariance structure is very stable, and that can also be in risk on markets, when usually uh, traditional trend following or time series momentum can have a difficult time because they are always kind of weak sort, our signals are moving faster and hence we believe allowed us to extract a more stable uh, risk premia or premia out of the markets. And maybe just w one more on that, just, um, you know, from the perspective of why you get these trends, you know, it's often described about the speed of reaction from investors and pe observe, people observing and behavioral biases like anchoring and then underreaction and overreaction, which intuitively is very obvious in respect to individual from the time series perspective, but maybe is less obvious on the relative trend, uh, I'm guessing, because you're basically detecting trends in these relative performances that not everybody is observing. Uh, so then uh, how do you get comfortable that that, that those types of moves are, are, are as grounded and, and will be as persistent? I think for us economically, or the hypothesis would be, because coming from this tactical approach, and when you think about the large in investors or the big money, if they change their strategic allocation or the tactical, what are they doing? They are actually exactly moving from one market segment into another one, hence creating flows from one market segment into another one. And as it happens, and this is, could be my economic explanation of those, let's say, quarterly trends, would be you are just detecting and following money flows. And the explanation would be that obviously large investors, the very large, large investors, they cannot implement their tactical moves within one or two days. So they would use a couple of weeks, probably, or even months to implement those maybe risk reduction or their regional focus. And our approach by analyzing these relative, let's say, market spreads allows us better to identify divergence between the different markets or markets that decorrelate from other markets for whatever reasons. But typically I would uh, attribute that to, let's say, money flows. And money flows are always relative, right? So they are coming somewhere and are going to somewhere. So we believe this is in a way the, the economic rationale behind it. And it also makes sense that you detect those type of trends then on a multi-week, multi-month period and not on an intraday or let's say a couple of days period. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, I was sitting listening to you, Bruno, and um, I'm trying to get my head around this relative trend, you know, maybe coming from from this pure side for, for so many years. Um, and I'm trying to come up with some really clever questions um, about it. So... 
so so one thing, some of the things that I noticed you said is that for the most part, your performance is highly correlated to the trend following index. Yet you are taking this additional step where you're taking 100 markets, you're turning them into 10,000 spreads. So just for me to understand, in one way, do you know why then the difference isn't bigger? Because you're, you're doing certainly a lot of extra work here compared to, let's call it the more simple way of, of doing trend following. And and if it isn't bigger in terms of difference, why not just do it the, 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 the easy way? <laughs> That's obviously a good question. So first, maybe a comment on correlation between different trend following models. So we all know all that correlation does not directly explain performance. So correlation in trend following models, in our view, is determined by the direction of a signal. So when everyone is short bonds, as, as last year, you're short bonds, you're short equities, you're long commodities, obviously you're highly correlated, but then the difference in performance really depends on the sizing of your positions. And even if the sizing is fundamentally different, correlation is high. And our approach of identifying trends on a relative basis, of course, if a market like, let's say, the S&P 500 starts to outperform all other equity markets, not only US markets, but also European markets, then typically it also has a, an, absolute, an absolute trend. So directionally, our signals and positions are probably pretty much, or I mean, we don't, uh, we, we know that, or they are, they are the same because obviously we run an adaptation of our models that just ignore that relative aspect. And apart from that is doing exactly the same thing. And uh, so to quantify what is the, the additional benefit and what is the, the additional kind of value by looking at that. And I mean, over the long term, we can just, you know, we just conclude that uh, in terms of sharp ratio, the improvement in taking into account this covariance structure and this uh, expansion of the universe, you can improve your sharp ratio by a magnitude of, let's say, 0.2 around right this doesn't sound a lot but over the long term obviously it is meaningful so our hypothesis is that the effect of adding this covariance structure in the signal generation process can increase your efficiency in terms of uh, sharp ratio expectation of the program by a magnitude of around 0.2 that does not mean, as we all know, or 0.2 is a dangerous, <laughs> or, uh, let's say, statement, because it does not mean that you will always un uh, outperform. It can take very long time until this uh, outperformance is kind of manifested. Yeah, no, that, that, that those are great points, uh, Bruno. I appreciate that. Now, you mentioned the sharp ratio, and I have actually in this series kind of maybe asked, I think, everyone uh, about it a little bit because of the paper that Cliff Asnes uh, wrote uh, along with some of his uh, colleagues from uh, AQR about whether we as an industry are becoming too focused on sharp um, and and so on and so forth. How do you see sharp as a um, as something to strive for? And let me give you a little bit more to 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 um, sort of lead you a little bit in terms of where I'm going. I mean, are we doing this? Do you think mostly because this is how potential and current investors think about it when they think about kind of risk adjusted returns, knowing full well, then when you have lots of upside volatility that, you know, it, it penalizes your shop. <laughs> so, so, um, or, or, or how, how, how does that play in, in a role? Because clearly it's something you've, you've thought about in, in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Yes, of course. So the discussion about volatility and sharp, maybe one should, uh, yeah, maybe differentiate that. So in terms of is volatility the right measure of risk, right? That, that alone is a, is, a, is a good question. And I would say it depends on what markets you are looking, uh, you are looking at, at what strategies you are looking at. 
in terms of, let's say, medium-term trend following and positions in futures, yes, I would argue, yes, of course, volatility is the right measure. Then the question is not, or the problem is not, is volatility the right or wrong measure, but the problem is we don't know what the real volatility is. And so we have to approach to estimate, to, to evaluate what the right volatility measure is to build our positions. And this is a, and that's also true for sharp, right? So if you ask me, is the sharp ratio on a, on a trend following program, the right measure on the long term to measure its success, I would definitely say, yes, of course, what else should it be? Because our investors want performance and long-term performance. So our mandate of our diversified program is clearly stated, yes, it should maximize the sharp ratio while being over the long term uncorrelated to any, let's say, or to most traditional and untraditional uh, risk factors. So this is our mandate. If now a client, of course, wants to adjust that, uh, if he wants to have, let's say, a trend model that should not have, uh, let's say, extreme beta exposure against equities, then in a second step, yes, of course, you can do that. But this comes at the second uh, stage and it will, by definition or uh, by our understanding, it will decrease the long-term sharp, right? Because any restrictions that we allow to enter will almost by definition or by design, decrease the long-term sharp. And in that sense, yes, I mean, who am I to disagree with Cliff Essness? But in that sense, I would disagree and say, no, our main mandate is to generate absolute returns and the maximal sharp ratio while diversifying. And we can uh, maybe discuss that later what diversification really means why diversify their portfolio holdings. And yes, we can do that in a second step, but it's not our main mandate. Okay, no, I think that that's fair. And and uh, and you say, who who am I to disc to to debate with Cliff Asnes? I mean, you're the one with the PhD, so who am I to discuss with you? But I do have one question that I'd like to to pose, and that is, well, what about the fact that you know, you could have trend following strategies that maybe are more pure with a much lower sharp, but a much higher long term return. And actually, perhaps with a more extreme trend following profile, which means that actually, as a portfolio tool, as a player in the portfolio of traditional investments, it might even have a bit of bigger benefit to the investor, right? So I know that we don't necessarily, dis we don't design our programs for what investors are going to use it for. We design it the best way we can. Um, but, but I guess maybe with my limited knowledge here of the math that you could say that, you know, if you just want pure trend, then maybe having the best sharp isn't what's going to give you the best returns over time. Um, but of course, you're going to have to accept more volatility and more drawdowns for sure. Yes, so I would kind of disagree because as a as a CTA or managed futures program, we in our case we exclusively invest in futures, right? And we use a daily rebalancing mechanism. So we adjust risk on a daily basis according to our target risk of uh, each position and uh, of the portfolio. So by that, as you know, as a managed futures investor, you typically in our case, we just use, uh, let's say, a margin of around 10, maybe 15%. Right? So there's a lot of room to, to scale up your, your exposures. So, and we, we run 2x or 4x strategies of our program. And actually, by our hypothesis, we can achieve exactly the, sa the same sharp in terms of when you measure a return and, and volatility in the right way. So you can level that up. So if you can achieve a 10% return with a 12% volatility, 
you should be able to achieve a 20% return with, uh, with a 24% volatility. So that's doable. We know that. So it can be leveled up by a daily rebalancing mechanism that really takes care of rebalancing in a short period. You cannot do that with, uh, let's say, a monthly or quarterly rebalance strategy because of the effect of, uh, of compounding. But if you, if you rebalance on a reasonably uh, small scale, you can multiply your, your return with the level of volatility. Yeah, maybe just to pick up on some aspects of that and maybe just to uh, give you the opportunity to, to talk a bit more about, you mentioned how you, that with the relative um, approach that, that the covariance matrix is embedded within the signal generation. So if you could maybe just explain that in a little bit more detail. And then one thing I'm thinking about is, is you know, if there is this greater sensitivity to the covariance matrix and correlation, you know, in times of stress and from the perspective of crisis alpha, you know, we've all heard that, you know, correlations going to one. Um, does that become problematic in, in kind of fulfilling? OK, you're not saying you have a crisis mal alpha mandate, but if there was a perception that that might be part of it, does, is that a challenge in, in, in delivering that type of uh, profile in, in crisis periods? Yes. So we are still let's say, model-driven, right? So we always use models, theoretical models, to justify what we are doing. And from a pure model perspective, we have the hypothesis that if we knew the market parameters, if we knew the covariance structure exactly, and if we knew the expected returns of the underlying markets, we know what we would come up with uh, a strategy, right? Uh, assuming no transaction costs and all that. And we want to come up with the best, let's say, estimated or closest solution to that. The big problem, of course, is how do you estimate your covariance matrix, right? And this is, of course, the, the difficult task. And even more so, how do you estimate your expected returns? Or because we all know that in financial markets, your signal to noise ratio, which is basically expected return to volatility, is very small, right? So there is a lot of noise and this noise will always be there in the markets and there will always be shocks in the, in the covariance matrix that per definition are shocks and are unpredictable. So. This is the real challenge of, uh, of our investment approach is how to model, how to estimate those covariance uh, matrices that go into our signal generation process, unlike uh, traditional, uh, the traditional approaches that have the same problem, by the way, when doing the, the portfolio construction, of course. Right? So we know that you can always be wrong when shock comes into the markets and disturbs your, your covariance matrix. And then typically that comes along at the same time with a trend reversal because your positions have all kind of ad adapted to a covariance structure and then a shock comes and then obviously usually you are on the wrong side of the trade by, by definition of being a trend follower because uh, typically these uh, shocks come after an end of a sustainable trend. And this is what, uh, what is the, the difficulty and uh, the pain in trend following, because it's something you have to accept because you cannot do anything about it. But we know that taking into account that covariance structure can improve uh, the, the trend following returns over the long term. And to your question on how does it come in, into the into the equation just think about again on risk adjusted spreads between different instruments and when do when you again normalize these risk adjusted uh, spreads you are measuring something like call it an information ratio or a generalized sharp ratio which is then dependent of the of the volatility of your spread which is by definition a function of the correlation so when this correlation changes, when you have a decoupling of one market against all the others, 
this comes typically together with a change in the correlation structure. And our approach is what we believe quite useful to detect this, uh, this divergence or this change in the covariance structure very early. But again, you are right. I mean, estimating the covariance matrix is, uh, is basically the biggest challenge. Okay. Well, that's maybe a good time to pick up on what, what's been going on in markets recently. Obviously, we've had a shock, as you say, um, in the form of a, you know, banking stress and strains. Um, and we've obviously, in, uh, obviously, we're recording in March uh, of uh, 2023. So we've had a big reversal in interest rate expectations. So um, maybe give us a sense on how the, 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 the system deals with that type of shock. I mean, obviously, uh, volatility in interest rate markets picked up very, very substantially. Um, and, and uh, you know, and from a correlation perspective, maybe um, you, you, we saw some shifts there as well. But, but, but what was your perspective on, was it more or less difficult running the relative trend in this environment? In this environment, it was actually not because after a quite a long time with sustainable trends, our positions were what we believe quite similar to a traditional CTA because the trends were kind of very consistent across all asset classes. So of course, the big trend, the big uh, confirmed trend was being short bonds, being short interest rate markets, having some, let's say, concentrated FX positions maybe. and. Then what happened last week was a perfect example of what we've uh, discussed before, that suddenly you have a shock in the covariance matrix, right? Everything changes. So co uh, correlation between equities and bonds just revert from one day to the other uh, in a massive way. And market prices are reverting across all asset classes. So this is a perfect example. And in that magnitude, also uh, quite a significant example that of course hit all medium-term trend follower because everyone had concentrated positions being short uh, rates, uh, longs on commodity markets, and then this shock leads to a reversal across all markets. In a period like that, when the covariance matrix has been quite stable for quite some time, our approach did not lead to a substantially different positions than the traditional approach. So I would say our relative approach did not outperform and did not underperform in that specific situation. But what is important to explain the behavior of trend following uh, performance in those scenario is that, and we, we actually quantified that effect and we came up that more than 50% of the risk reduction that followed because as a trend follower you have to to reduce your risk positions because volatility exploded so more than 50 percent of the portfolio changes after that uh, shock was driven actually by volatility and not by trend signals this is also something we also highlighted that in one of our publications earlier that risk management and portfolio construction has a significant impact on the position sizing. So it's not only about signals, it's a lot about risk management and portfolio construction. And in that event as well, so the biggest, uh, let's say, change in positioning, and this is what I expect would be the same uh, throughout the industry, was actually triggered by the, by the jumps in volatility and even less so by the methodology that you apply to to measure your trends in the portfolio. Okay. And in terms of the methodologies for measuring, I mean, in volatility and covariance, I mean, you, there are differences across the industry um, and obviously different lookbacks. Is that, do you see that as a source of alpha in, in, in your approach? Or how do you think about what's the right way of doing that? Yes. Actually, we don't see that as a, as a source of alpha. Effectively, we believe what, what should your volatility or risk measure, uh, what should it result in? And actually being or having a medium term or let's say quarterly investment horizon, you want to forecast or manage medium term volatility. 
right? So a couple of weeks, what, what will be the volatility or the, the realized covariance over the next couple of weeks? So it's not really important what it will be over the next two days or over the next three years. So the, the typical investment horizon is around, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks to maybe a, a couple of months. And what we found, and actually this is, I think, very interesting, is the methodology that we use in general, I mean, we use some adaptations, has not been changed over the last 20 years, which is, I think, quite, uh, quite surprising. So our lookbacks and our typical lookbacks to estimate a couple of weeks volatility or covariance matrix are still, we find the best way of looking at this is using an exponential weighted moving average, of course. And uh, surprisingly, the, the DK factor that was initially in 1998 proposed by J.G. Morgan, I think it was, uh, using a lookback uh, a DK factor of 4.94 has still generated the most robust, let's say, predictions of volatility and covariance throughout the last 20 years, which I find remarkable or there because people always think, yeah, everything has gone faster and market structure changed a lot. And yes, market structure changed a lot on a high frequency, right? Intraday markets are not comparable to what they were 20 years ago, but those intraday moves have no predicting power or no effect on medium term performance. So the market structure in our view over a medium term horizon has not changed over the last 20 years. It's still the same. And back to your question, yes, you can use any reasonable risk methodology that is able to kind of forecast or predict medium term volatility but we all know and again our volatility forecast is not the real volatility in the markets it's just a forecast and if you are a little bit wrong it does not have uh, an impact and by definition you cannot predict shocks to this volatility uh, to the real volatility so in that sense uh, it should be just a robust methodology. And if you have a robust methodology, you have to obviously adapt and adjust for, for certain periods. For instance, in the last couple of years, of course, we had some uh, extreme low volatility in some of the markets. And then, of course, in order to, to protect uh, your positions from big shifts, you maybe work with wall floors or with just other measures or you use non-parametric extreme events and just limit your potential exposure by, uh, let's say, past observations or whatever methodology you can use, but still, in fact, a very robust exponential weighted moving average approach to, to volatility has been uh, superior. Can I follow up on that? Um, because it was actually one of the things I was thinking about, and then you kind of already uh, spoke a little bit about it. So clearly what's happened uh, in the last, and I don't even know whether it's the last 10 years or 15 years, but but you're, you're right, because of the changes in the volatility regime, uh, managers said, well, hang on, we need to put in a flaw uh, to volatility. And you can do that in a different way. You can just put a flaw, but you could also just say we have a long-term volatility uh, estimation. We have a shorter term. Fine. Okay. What about correlation, Bruno? And I don't. I actually don't know the answer to this. I mean, does it make sense to have two different, let's just say, lookbacks for correlation? Because clearly, we know that you know, in the last couple of years, correlations between equities and bonds have been very different from the longer term. But if you get to these kind of let's put it very simply, if you get an extreme change of correlation, and let's just for argument's sake say that the current correlation, positive correlation between stocks and bonds, at least up until recently, um, was the unusual. I'm not even sure it is, but let's just say it was. Then, of course, you could have some even more uh, shocks if you've kind of based your your uh, <laughs> covariance and, and your correlations based on, on, on that uh, correlation, and then it turns out to be completely quote unquote wrong uh, at some point so so I, I'm, I'm really curious about this because I, I don't know the the ins and out whether 
whether it, it whether you do it or whether it even makes sense to look at correlation also in more than just one time frame. Yes, it depends on where your covariance estimator goes in or plays a role in your investment process, right? So in our case, it plays a role in the signal generation process. And then in the portfolio construction process, it goes in into just managing the overall risk exposure of the portfolio, which are two completely different things. And yes, it might be that you use different let's say timeframes or different uh, approaches so to these kind of, of uh, volatilities and variances. But at the end, again, my approach to that would be you always want to have some parameters or some, some uh, an approach to estimating that that is quite robust. So your overall but long-term portfolio should not be impacted a lot whether you alter just a little bit or even a bit more your approach to measuring that risk. It should be stable and it should focus and on target uh, a, a very robust approach. And then it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable, uh, it's a reasonable method. And we all know that especially when covariances and correlations go in, not typically they enter the the investment process or the decisions with the inverse so we have you have to invert that and then just mathematically it gets uh i would say interesting to to model that but you have to be very careful because when you just apply that very naively you can get disastrous results and actually, that that would be another topic that I'd love to to bring up with you because I'm sure you can help um, our audience think about this a little bit. One of the things that I feel that we as an industry, and I know there are other, obviously other quant based strategies that 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 I would would also apply here, but I think one of the things, one of the key skills we really bring to the table, is that we take ideas, we formulate rules, we do thorough research. But we do research in a way where we have a high expectation that when we apply or deploy it live, it looks similar, meaning that we avoid a lot of the pitfalls about backtesting and all of that because we know there's never been a bad backtest that's sort of the day of light, so to speak, or light of day, I should say. But so so can you talk a little bit about, um, and obviously without giving any secret sauce away, but, but just generally what what are the things that one needs to be careful about and 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 you already alluded to some of it but but what 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 is good research and how do you then turn good research into a good live uh, uh implementation yeah so that's definitely the 1 million dollar question <laughs> so our approach has always been what we do and our models should be very robust. That means they should have a very low number of free parameters. And in one way, how we achieved that already in the first stage that I quickly uh, uh, mentioned in risk adjusting by risk adjusting or risk normalizing all the markets that we trade, we already reduced the dimension in the sense that we treat all markets after that exactly the same. So we do not need different models for commodities or for equities because everything that we trade is just a risk factor that is already uh, risk normalized and we apply the same methodology to all markets. And the only thing that then is, is different can be the correlation structure between the markets. So this this uh, actually uh, depends then on on the specific uh, state of the of the markets. But to answer your question, our approach to research has never been just let's add some whatever stylized fact in the market that has worked in a backtest. So everything we do should make sense from a theoretical perspective or should be explained by some market behavior. For instance, as we said before, we believe we can rationalize the, the case for uh, medium term relative uh, trend following by the fact that it will follow money flows from different investors right? on, the, on the same scale. 
and everything we do should have a rational to to, to um, represent a theoretical model, right? Because in trend following, the big challenge, and I'm sure you discussed it before, is diversification is key. Or we need many different instruments. We need many different sources of returns because when you apply a trend following model and whatever systematic model on one particular instrument on a medium term, you can never expect, let's say, a, a sharp ratio higher than maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So it's usually even lower than the sharp ratio of a buy and hold. And the only way how you can inflate that sharp ratio is by adding many, many different sources of trend following returns and by the fact that those trend following PLs have a much lower correlation than just long only positions. So by just the law of diversification, by adding more and more markets, you can lift up your your um, uh, your overall sharp ratio. And then you know how hard it is or to I mean everyone can create the back test on an instrument giving you a sharp ratio of 0.2, right? That's that's nothing. So, and the sharp ratio of 0.2 would already qualify or to enter your model. In our case, we would never do that until there is a clear rationalization or model. Why should this, or what does that additional, let's say, signal brings in a portfolio context? And if it brings something, then we, we, would research it and then we we would enter it right but in our case and again focus of research is not necessarily always in adding new signals new approaches it's even more important we research implementation implementation techniques right because we know if we have a better implementation by smoothing out unnecessary trades we can lower the fixed costs, right? So we always operate under the assumption that we want to implement our systematic models with a threshold of overall implementation costs of less than half a percent per year, right? And this needs a lot of research. And you can apply your research and you see an immediate effect of it because it's almost deterministic over time. When it comes to adding new signals, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's much more complicated because you have the tendency to all of it. So our research is actually even, almost more focused on implementation, on risk management, on uh, let's say uh, portfolio construction, and then uh, uh, and of course also signal generation. But we do not favor let's say signal generation over the other over the other aspects. No, that makes sense. And we've obviously heard from other uh, managers um, that they do spend a lot of time uh, focusing on uh, on execution and all of those things fully understand. I, I, get, I sit back with the impression that um, a, a lot of the things that you do today are things that you discovered, uh, you know, 20 years ago, so to speak. However, I am curious if there is one or two things you would say over the 20 year period that has passed where you say, yeah, we did make a couple of important discoveries um, that we, that, that kind of changed the way we, that we, we do things. Would you say that there has been a few of those as well? I mean, first you're right though. Our basic philosophy is still the same. This has been unchanged, right? But nevertheless, we have learned so much over the last 20 years to understand better where does it come from? How should we improve? How big can an in uh, incremental improve of, of a specific strategy? Uh, how big can that be? And in that sense, yes, I mean, we, we learned a lot and we are learning uh, new things every, every quarter, every week, every month. And this makes the whole thing so exciting. So to answer your question, yes, what we believe we understand much better this kind of the market structure is kind of why does our approach work 
why do we believe is our relative approach a bit better suited over the long term to generate the higher uh, a higher sharp ratio why is diversification so um, so important why is implementation how, what can we do with implementation these are all things that we basically 20 or 15 years ago we did not we did not really care and we care now much more so i think our understanding of what we are doing is uh, has been exponentially uh, is exponentially higher than it was 10 15 years ago yeah maybe just to 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 kind of uh, build on that but also to go back to to the start uh, where you talked about that experience of working in a private bank um uh, you know because obviously people tend to allocate a trend following as part of a, a multi-asset portfolio. So, I mean, from that perspective, do you think, you know, some of the conversations we've had with other managers around when you include trend in a traditional portfolio, a client may want to make some adjustments, like say, for example, capping the equity beta, et cetera. Have you looked at that? Or I suppose my question is, if you were now back in that original role you were in and you were applying the, the Quantica Managed Futures in the context of, of a multi-asset portfolio, would it be just as it is or what, would there be, um, you know, would, would, would it be adjusted in any way w when it's applied within the context of a larger portfolio? Yes, it depends. So if, if you come from a typically or usually I would say rather stable portfolio that those clients have, then I would say Yes, you should add it in the, in the diversified way. If you use, for instance, a very active uh, strategy of steering or managing your, for instance, equity exposure, and you want that to be pure to your approach, then yes, it might make sense to exclude that, uh, that uh, beta exposure from our exposure. So it depends what the clients wants to do with it or if the clear objective of including trend is in some call it risk mitigation or things like that then yes it might make sense or in an overall portfolio context to do some restriction on our trend approach but overall i would believe that even in those cases the long-term effect on the overall portfolio would be very similar so and again with every restriction you are just reducing your expected sharp of your trend allocation, which again is not something that I believe is, uh, um, yeah, pays off over the long term. I mean, we can maybe discuss again now this kind of notion of investor want crisis alpha or they want tail risk protection. Yes, they want that, but have you seen any manager? Uh, surviving with the tail risk protection product i mean are those investors really willing to pay a premium and this is in a way you can get crisis alpha right but you have to pay a premium and this is why we do not anymore use the term crisis alpha to promote let's say our strategy instead i would say crisis alpha is something describing a tail risk protection, right? Or more, bit more a short-term effect. And we all know that you pay the price over the long term. And again, this is over the long term, not what investors should target or because uh, they should as well overall optimize their long-term performance, of course, subject to some risk restrictions. But again, in the past 20 years, I've not seen one happy tail risk investor, a uh, tail risk protection investor, and not one happy tail risk uh, hedging manager. But I might be wrong. I guess, you know, uh, partially uh, some of these considerations are in, in relation to kind of time scale, um, you know, and obviously the, the characteristics of, of managed futures and, and, and trend following look different at, at, at different time, time scales, I guess, in terms of. Uh, convexity and skewness, etc. And obviously, you started off with that kind of quarterly, uh, kind of medium term hor horizon. So I guess, does that kind of time scale perspective inform part of that portfolio construction um, uh, process? 
Yes, so this is something which I believe is is very important and not widely understood or people usually uh, talk about returns or trend following returns or crisis alpha without even specifying the period that defines, let's say, for instance, a crisis or that defines some characteristics of your returns. And unlike traditional investments, trend following investments or trend following PLs have very different characteristics over different time frames, right? So the the usual connotation with trend following is yeah, trend followers are offering uh, skewed, right skewed returns, are offering convexity and things like that. And this is not really true for all frequencies. On a daily basis, trend following returns are heavily left skewed. On a weekly, monthly, that that skewness slowly moves to the right and you see the full benefit of uh, trend following returns on a quarterly basis and not on a not on a daily or weekly basis. And uh, this is exactly what I think is very important and you see the effect of trend following diversification and benefits to portfolio is best seen again on this tactical horizon on one quarter. And this is why, I mean, we usually attribute that or that, that in my view, the biggest benefit of trend following on a quarterly time scale is what we would call smart diversification, right? So that means. Yes, over the long term, it's great to be uncorrelated. But in fact, a trend follower is not always uncorrelated. He has uh, directional positions. And the great effect of trend following almost by design is that you have a negative correlation or a, a negative beta in kind of a bear market environment, and you have a positive beta and positive correlation on the right tail of the distribution, on the bull market. Though. And this is how we try to, to describe the, the biggest benefit is that the performance on a quarterly basis of trend following is surprisingly regime independent and we call it regime independence or smart diversification. And in my view, what the term crisis alpha has basically two problems. So the first is the word crisis, because it's not really defined in terms of magnitude and in terms of frequency. For some investors, a 5% drop in, uh, in a week in the S and P is a crisis. For for some twenty uh, percent drop in in three months is not a crisis, uh, but by definition a crisis should be a rare event or tail event, so it should not happen too often. And then my second concern with crisis alpha is alpha, right? Because alpha is kind of a constant, or the describes usually the constant term in the regression, so it's kind of a a constant premia that you get in a crisis. And uh, I think this is probably true for a tail risk hedge strategy, but not for uh, trend following CTAs. So if I would term it, I would rather uh, replace the alpha by negative beta. You should call it, if at all, call it negative crisis beta, but of course that's more, that's too complicated. <laughs> and then I would replace the crisis by a more wider, let's say regime of, um, quarterly returns that could be termed like a bear market. And then we can, can talk about negative beta in bear market that comes together with the positive beta in bull market, but maybe this goes a bit too far in that discussion. Yeah. I, I don't think a negative crisis beta is going to take off uh, <laughs> so do I, as a so term. Do I. Uh, Neil, so what do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it'll be cheap to get the Google ad word for that particular phrase. Um, let's put it that way. Um, but, but by the way, um, what I will suggest to people listening to us today is actually to go back and listen to the episode uh, a few weeks ago we did with Katie Kaminsky because I brought up 
exactly those kind of concerns, not exactly the same, but the, the concern or the challenge that I have had in the last 10 years with the word or with the term crisis alpha. And actually, Katie did a great job explaining what she meant with it originally. So I think it's it's probably lost in translation. And if you listen to what she says now in terms of the origin of that phrase, it actually still makes perfect sense, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rehearse that now because I do want to um, go somewhere else, and that is Bruno. People have been listening to us for one hour and three minutes or thereabouts at this time, and clearly, with everything you've explained, people must sit back with the feeling that oh, trend following it's so easy. What, you know, why are they getting paid so much for doing so little, right? <laughs> but as we all know, uh, and and hopefully has been made clear today, it is not easy. And there's a lot of things that go into it. So um, I can't stop myself from asking you a little bit about those who have come out uh, in recent years um, and had great success last year in saying, well, there's no real need to pay much for trend following or CTA returns. We can replicate that. Uh, we can just do a linear regression on returns, and we do that. And I say that in a in a loving way because obviously, um, you know, one of the uh, one of the people who does that is is also co-hosting on the podcast. So we have this back and forth debate about this. Um, but I do want to try and address the different aspect of 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 uh, this uh, topic because I think it is important, especially for investors who are maybe looking to enter. Uh, our our world um, and who may consider replication versus going to uh, a few managers. How do you see this and 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 what are some of the the dangers you may see in re, uh, in replication versus let's call it the real thing to quote uh, a Coca Cola uh, uh, ad advertisement? Yes, obviously important question is and. As I pointed out, right, I mean, 20 years ago, trend following was considered a complete black box. No one thought has any had, has had any idea of what a trend follower is going to do. It's all a machine. It's kind of very intransparent. And that switched tremendously, probably 10, 8 years ago, or with the publishing of simple papers that just explained how can you replicate trend following correlation, which we all know is extremely easy. Or you hire a first year student and he will program you a trend following program that is applied on five instruments and he will come up with something that correlates 0.8% or 80% to, to, uh, to CTAs. But replicating correlation is not replicating performance. And again, just the great advantage of those replicators is obviously transparency. So people can understand positioning better because they can look it, uh, look it up. And when it comes to cost, yes, maybe, but still, I mean, usually they are not as cheap as uh, one would think, but obviously they have advantages of transparency and, uh, and cost. However, and again, relating to our models, they have clear disadvantages. And the clear disadvantage is typically the, the risk management or rebalancing pr uh, process, because I don't know uh, those uh, products all in detail, but some I heard they rebalance every month, maybe, or every week, which is already clearly from a model perspective, not optimal. The second one that I mentioned is diversification. So some of those uh, replicators, they replicate the CTA uh, returns or industry with, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 of the most liquid instruments. And yes, with those instruments, you can get the correlation of 0.8, but you give up, again, this theoretical or the, the, the real result of diversification benefits by adding just more markets. And my estimate for that alone would be that will result in a lower sharp ratio of around 0.2 over the long term. But again, of course, if you have a sharp ratio of 0.4 compared to a sharp ratio of 0.6, you can still outperform over one, two, three, four years. So I think that the great thing on that product, and especially last year, was 
in a year when the trends have been really, really strong in our asset classes, such a product can, can immensely outperform and that this is great. But I have some concerns in the value proposition in times when those products underperform after costs, right? Because they shouldn't underperform over a couple of, let's say, one, two, three years, because otherwise they would have a, a difficult, uh, yeah, difficult value proposition. And uh, this will definitely happen as well, because you cannot, with any approach you have, you cannot outperform all the time. And then I think in, term, in times of underperformance, still, uh, I would say, a diversified or well-researched product has much better arguments than just a replicator. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Alan, uh, maybe the last round of questions from your side before we wrap up with uh, Bruno? Yeah, maybe just um, a final one uh, in terms of, you know, you touched on kind of how you've enhanced or you, you see the potential for enhancing uh, risk adjusted returns with, with, with the uh, introduction of um, the, the, the both types of trend following. But in general, um, when, when clients ask you, you know, how to think about returns uh, for the space, what, how do you answer that? Is there, you know, beyond looking at what different types of trend following have delivered historically, is, is there, um, you know, is there anything else? And, and how confident would we can we be that that kind of historic return profile sh should be there going forward? Look, our outlook, or let's say our long-term outlook for trend following has, unlike others, has not changed over the last uh, 18, 20 years. So our long-term outlook should, with the, with the, let's say, approach like ours, should lead to a long-term sharp ratio of approximately one on a gross basis before fees, but after implementation, right? And obviously there can be times oh, which with a, with a much smaller, um, a much smaller performance and you will have drawdowns at this, uh, you can all assess that by simulation or by other, other techniques, but on the long-term uh, view, Nothing has changed in, in that approach, but you can only achieve that, or let's say stay at this level by adding, let's say some incremental imp uh, improvements or because otherwise our assumption is your long-term sharp, if you just don't change anything will gradually decrease and you have to make up. Uh, uh, for this gradual decrease with your research process. So what we see in that direction is obviously, again, expanding the, the universe, adding more diversification, adding, I don't want to call it alternative markets, but just uh, adding other sources of trend following returns to the existing ones improving on on the risk management techniques that could also maybe lead to small incremental increases but overall that hypothesis has not changed in our view on the long term but uh, yeah still not trend following as we all know is a very painful strategy because most of the time you can be underwater and you can uh, have periods of one two three years that you are underwater, which makes managing and also from an investor type of view, makes it very difficult. Or, and then you start questioning your approach. You are maybe forced by investors to change things. Although on the long-term view, nothing has changed. Or, and this is, I think, the big challenge uh, everyone in our, our industry has. But on the other hand, we also see uh, a lot of resilience or in our industry because most of the competition and on the of the successful trend following CTS they are around for 15 20 30 40 years 
Yeah, I think we can all relate to the, those points, uh, Bruno. So well, well said. Um, no, I just want to uh, finish off with the the two questions I always um, finish off with. Um, so maybe you already are prepared for what I'm going to ask you, Bruno. But but we do want to uh, we do want to hear from from our friends. Um, you know, what's the one thing they hear about trend following that they disagree with the most? So um, I'm curious whether whether you have like one pet peeve that you that really gets to you when you hear it. So one statement about trend following I've heard, and I'm not the only one, I'm sure you've heard the same over the last 20 years, probably in the frequency of two or three years, people come up and say, look, trend following does not work anymore. It's just gone. It's that the sharp ratios, the expectations are at zero. They are much, much smaller. Markets got more efficient and trend following is dead. And this is the statement that I would disagree the most with because a year like last year, again, or is a, is a very good counter example to that statement, but we all know all these events are probably rare and the best advice would be, yes, just look at it as a long-term investment, stay in it and, uh, and live through these more difficult periods. But uh, this is the thing I would disagree the most. A simple statement that trend following is dead. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And, and final question maybe would be, um, and, and I know we're still early in the year 2023, uh, but a lot of things have already happened, so to speak. So certainly not boring so far. But but when you look at sort of a little bit into the future, and I don't mean from a return point of view, but I just generally speaking, uh, what are you most sort of excited about overall? Or, or And are there any things that kind of gives you a, a source of concern? One thing we haven't even talked about uh, today, but you did a recent uh, paper on um, a, a, another great paper from 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 your firm, and and that that is kind of the footprint of CTAs liquidity. I've talked uh, probably for quite a while. Um, some people might say for too long about my concerns about liquidity. Um, and although maybe pe many people might think about liquidity as just can we execute our orders, but actually, uh, as we started out by referencing the recent events in the banking system, is another kind of liquidity event to some e e extent. So anyways, I, I didn't mean to to force you in a certain direction with your answer, but, but anything that stands out when you look into the future that of things that you're either excited about or concerned about? Yes, so when I'm... What I'm most excited about in the situations that we are in now is that we have a fully systematic strategy. So I don't want to be, I wouldn't want to be in the, in the shoes of discretionary managers that have to assess the situations and take bets on their own assessment of the situation, because in a situation like that, where uncertainties are, again, I would say bigger than uh, normal. It's just great to have something proven or uh, a systematic approach that we all know we can uh, go into a drawdown, but we understand these kind of mechanisms. We are confident about the approach, but uh, this is the first point uh, that I would like to mention. The second one that goes into the same direction is I'm very excited about that our investment universe uh, is within the future space. Because when you talk about liquidity and what we need as a CTA is we need access to, I would say, risk adjusted liquidity, right? So if the spreads are going up, but volatility is going up, then it's not a problem for us because we always trade in units of risk. And we have never really seen a degradation of risk adjusted liquidity in futures markets, even in the most distressed periods, on a risk-adjusted basis, liquidity was always uh, provided in the in the futures markets, and this is what uh, is hopefully here to stay. But in situations like that, like we are now, um, this is definitely, I believe, a huge advantage of uh, of a CTA approach compared to to a, a, a different type of macro exposure. Yeah. I like those answers. And actually, I want to repeat it. I want to I rephrase the last point you made because I think it's so important. 
and that is for CTAs, the most liquid markets are the most volatile markets. People don't realize that, I think, for the most part. Um, but that is a very important point that you made there, Bruno. Thank you so much. It's a great way to uh, wrap up our conversation. Uh, Bruno, thank you so much for being on the podcast, sharing your thoughts, your insights, uh, and and your journey. And we hope we could do this sometime in the future again. To all of you listening in today, I hope you were able to take something from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues. From Alan and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged as we continue our deep dive into the CTA industry. And in the meantime, go check out the show notes for this episode and all the other resources you can find on our website. And not least, of course, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.